Hello and welcome back to Manifolds, the video series where we want to integrate on generalized surfaces. And indeed, we are getting closer and closer to this topic because now we already know what Riemannian manifolds are. And in today's part 34, we will look at some examples. However, as always, before we start with that, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via Patreon. And please don't forget, with the link in the description, you find my website where you find the additional material. Okay, then I would say, let's immediately start by recalling what a Riemannian metric is. And we have learned it's not so complicated at all, because it's just a map G that sends every point P from the manifold to an inner product. In fact, GP should be an inner product defined on the tangent space. And then the only thing we have to ask for this map is that it is a smooth map. And as usual, the first examples we should consider are submanifolds in Rn. They are easy to visualize and they should also already carry some geometry. In other words, there we already should have a canonical Riemannian metric. And now in order to keep the notation clear, let's say that this submanifold lives in R capital N. Hence, we can still say that we have a lowercase n dimensional submanifold M. And now we can use that the surrounding Rn here has a standard geometry already. In short, this is the Euclidean geometry given by the standard inner product. Therefore, if we translate that to the submanifold, we get a standard Riemannian metric on the manifold M. And indeed, this one we can immediately write down. However, please recall, for submanifolds we can make everything a little bit simpler by using the concrete tangent space. In fact, this was the first tangent space definition we wrote down. To distinguish it from the abstract tangent space, we usually put a sub in the index here. However, we already know there is no essential difference between both of them because we have an isomorphism there. But the good thing for the submanifold tangent space is that the tangent vectors are immediately given. More precisely, if we have a parameterization phi, we just need the partial derivatives here. And because the dimension of the tangent space here is n, we only need n tangent vectors. Hence, in this sense, the parameterization phi gives us all the tangent vectors we need. And then by just writing the span, we have the whole tangent space embedded in Rn. And therefore, we also have the standard inner product in this vector space. So angles, lengths and so on make sense in this vector space here. And with that, we can immediately write down the matrix G that describes our Riemannian metric. Namely, Gij is given by the inner product where we put in two tangent vectors. The first one should be the partial derivative with respect to xi, and the second the partial derivative with respect to xj. And now to be more precise, we would say here on the left hand side we have the point P on the manifold and on the right hand side here we have the point P tilde on the lower level. You know, this is the common thing to do, we distinguish the variables we use. Okay, so now this is something you really should remember, a submanifold in Rn can always be seen as a Riemannian manifold. It always carries a standard metric with it. Therefore, now let's look at some common examples. Maybe a simple one would be a one-dimensional manifold in Rn. Indeed, we could just visualize that as a curve in Rn. And then a parameterization phi needs only one variable. And let's simply call this one variable t. Moreover, this also means that our tangent space here is also one-dimensional. Hence, the Riemannian metric is given by a 1 times 1 matrix. In other words, there is just G11 to calculate for us. It's still given by the standard inner product, but now we don't need partial derivatives because phi only has 1. 
So to keep it simple, we can just write phi prime of t. And then we can simplify that by writing the norm of phi prime of t. It's the standard Euclidean norm and of course squared. Now, maybe you already know how to calculate the length of a curve in Rn by using an integral. In fact, if the parameterization phi is defined on the interval a to b, then we have an integral from a to b. And inside the integral, we simply find the norm of phi prime t. So what we see here is that the Riemannian metric occurs inside the integral when we want to calculate a length. More precisely, we have the square root of the determinant of g. The determinant might not be clear yet, but this is the generalization we will do soon. So for example, for a two-dimensional manifold, this construction should give the area of the manifold. However, the integration we will do in another video, let's first look at another example here. So we could look at the S2 manifold embedded in R3. This is a nice two-dimensional manifold and we know it has a parameterization given by spherical coordinates. I don't want to go into the details where this parameterization is defined, but I want to give you the formula for it. And since lowercase phi is already a variable inside the parameterization, let's call the function capital phi. And then it has two inputs, theta and lowercase phi. These describe two angles on the sphere and I don't want to change the common names at all. So now what we have with respect to theta is the sine of theta in the first two coordinates and the cosine of theta in the last one. And then with respect to phi, we have the cosine of phi and the sine of phi in the first two coordinates. So these are the spherical coordinates where the radius is set to 1. And then we can conclude that we have exactly two tangent vectors. As we have discussed before, the only thing we need are the partial derivatives. So not a problem at all, you just need to know the derivatives of cosine and sine. So what we get with respect to theta are cosine of theta in the first two components and minus sine of theta in the last component. And with respect to phi, we first get zero in the last component and then sine and cosine exchanged in the first two components, but again with a minus sign here. Okay, then we can go to the next step where we just have to calculate inner products with these tangent vectors. And then we get our 2 times 2 matrix G. In fact, this is not complicated at all. You just have to know how to deal with sine squared and cosine squared. And then what we get is 1 here, 0 and 0 there. And then the only interesting component is the lower right corner with sine of theta squared. So this is our standard Riemannian metric on the sphere S2. And now similarly to before, we could also look at the determinant here. More precisely, we want to calculate the determinant of g in the square root. And what we get is the absolute value of sine of theta. And now as a cliffhanger for the next videos, I can already tell you a little bit about a volume form. We will use the square root of the determinant together with a two form to calculate areas or other integrals on S2. Indeed, the scaling factor here, given by the Riemannian metric, is exactly what we want in the end. And that's also a reason why it makes sense to generalize Riemannian metrics to abstract manifolds. Because then we are also able to measure abstract volumes on the manifold. Okay, I think that's good enough for today. Let's meet in the next video where we discuss more about these volume forms. So I really hope we meet again and have a nice day. Bye bye.